a special thank you to the Murphy Library because having grown up in West Reading, I spent some of my earliest and brightest days here. Uh, actually, in this very room, I was a member of uh, Crabs, which was kids raving about books. So, uh, I also want to thank the Danbury Cultural Commission. Uh, they've supported my work for the last few years, and along with North Carolina Book Life Institute, uh, they've, they've uh, a lot of my research wouldn't have been possible without their input. So, thank you very much. Um, I'm a folklorist. Uh, for the last 12 years, I've been a professional musician, but I've shifted into folklore in the last few um, because of this young lady here. This is Lena Bear Turbyfill, and she was born in Elk Park, North Carolina, on the border of Tennessee in the Appalachian Mountains. And I had been doing some research on Appalachian music and came across a compilation uh, done by the Library of Congress uh, featuring recordings by Alan Lomax and Herbert Hopper in the 30s. And uh, I think I'd just been doing some other work and uh, had been listening to these compilations. They're called uh, Anglo-American Ballads. Uh, she was on the second volume. And the only thing that she uh, was featured uh, performing on that compilation uh, I was uh, going over emails or doing some work, and I heard the line, we'll stick her little baby full of needles and pins. And I thought, <laughs> what am I hearing? So I rewound the, you know, played the, the song over again. And she sang a thing called Bo Lakins, uh, which I, I had no context for that song at the time. Uh, I later learned that it was a diminutive of a ballad called Lampkin. So through the years, it kind of got smoothed out or some was missing it turned into Bo Lakins, uh, and that's what the family called it. Um, I was about to ask you to go to the next slide. <laughs> Just one second. Sure. We're trying to arrange it so everyone on Zoom can see both. Right. So this is Lena. And then if you do scroll down to the next slide. Uh, this is this is Lena on the right holding uh, one of her granddaughters and the rest of Lena's family in North Carolina in about 1962. Um, I couldn't find a lot of information about Lena on the web. Uh, only two uh, recordings were published at the time. Uh, one was this Bo Lakins, which just caught me totally unawares. And I learned out there was another piece called Lily Shaw that she sung with her sister, which was also a pretty bloody song uh, about a Tennessee murder uh, where the body is burned and the person's on the gallows. And so I, I just couldn't understand why these sweet girls were singing these uh, rather drastic songs and uh, rather than keep talking about them i'd like to just give you an example of, of what what i was kind of experiencing on first listen <laughs> So that's part of a ballad called Lampkin, and it's one of the oldest Scottish ballads in existence. And uh, it must have taken place in the 13th or 12th century because at that time, any major construction, uh, castle or bridge or church, uh, they, they required some sort of sacrifice to ensure the integrity of the structure. So anything larger than a house was usually, uh, there was some sort of sacrificial right. So um, I learned all of this later, but uh, in the meantime, I was left with, with very few uh, audio examples of Lena. So, I dug in and I found out um, that Lena was recorded by a gentleman who appears on the next slide called uh, Dr. Herbert Halpert. And here he is interviewing a, a sea captain. Um, Herbert Halpert was sort of a contemporary. I'm sure a lot of people know who Alan Lomax is, or have at least heard the name Alan Lomax, perhaps. He's sort of a household name. He'd gone around the American South and done field recordings and interviews. But Herbert Halpert had operated. Uh, around the same time as Alan Lomax, and so I was I was really fascinated by again this this family singing so sweetly about such unusual things. And so uh, what I wanted to do was make arrangements uh, to go to the Library of Congress and listen to the rest of Lena and her family's repertoire. There were about five dozen recordings of her, her two sisters, her father, a neighbor, and her sister-in-law. 
and uh, the worst possible thing happened, which is that I scheduled it for March of 2020. Oh. <laughs> so I don't have to tell you the Library of Congress closed for the foreseeable, and I was left uh, pretty much in a in a, a deadlock of you know not being able to visit. Uh, their transfer center was shut down. They weren't even going into the building, except if it was absolutely vital. So uh, my my dream of hearing these recordings and learning more about the family uh, was shuttered, or so I thought. Uh, so left to my own devices, I kind of did some internet sleuthing, and I, I really attempted to, to find more than just these two songs. And um, here's another uh, image of Herbert Halper. Um, so to give you some background before I move on, uh, Herbert Hopper worked for the WPA. Uh, he had made a few expeditions into the Pine Barrens in New Jersey and the Middle Atlantic states in the early 30s. But his first major expedition uh, in 1939 was down to the southern states, Missouri and Virginia and North Carolina and Tennessee. And what the WPA was able to do is paint an old ambulance streetcar black, which is what you see here. And they fitted all of the different cabinets with recording equipment sized spaces and things for his notebooks and whatever. And so he drove down to uh, the American South uh, as part of a WPA program uh, that pretty much was shut down when he came back to New York. He had just made it under the sliding door or whatever. And um, all the while he was down there, he was enjoying life with these people and, and waiting for other shipments of these aluminum discs, recording discs to come in so he could cut more discs and record more songs. And when he came back to New York City, he was like, I'm so sorry, I didn't get enough recorded. And they were like, what are you talking about? You asked for more discs than anyone that we've sent. We got hundreds of recordings. So uh, it was a really um, vital and interesting trip that he made. And he certainly recorded some of the most beautiful music I've ever heard, uh, including Lena and her family. Um, people remember Lomax. I wish they would remember Halford a little bit more. But anyway, um, at the time, I couldn't hear these recordings. I just had you know, what was available on the web. And so I dug into Ancestry.com and uh, on a hunch got in touch with her last uh, living kin uh, and uh, talked to some of the grandkids or whatever. And, and, and what ended up transpiring is I was introduced to uh, Nicola, we called her Aunt Nikki. Uh, this was Lena's last living daughter. Uh, and I just about fell over uh, on our first phone call because she said that she was pretty old and in pretty poor health and, and didn't have a lot of memories. Uh, could remember her mom singing, but nothing specific except that old Bill Lakin song. I just got told because wouldn't you know that would be the one that she remembered. Um, so uh, if you go to the next slide, uh, I did end up meeting her uh, in July of 2020. I just decided to drive uh, down and, and and meet her despite COVID, and she still lived in Elk Park, not 500 feet away from her parents' homestead, and uh, and she she consented to record, and she gave me this. And that was the only song she could remember her mom singing at the time. Uh, but through meeting her and some of her other relatives, it became pretty clear that uh, there was a lot of memory that I could slowly work with the family and extract. <clears throat> and and Nikki, uh, there's, a, there's a photo of Nikki singing uh, into my field recorder. I've never had someone hold it like a walkie-talkie before, so that was kind of fun. <laughs> Usually just put it on the table and forget about it. But she, uh, she certainly uh, was pretty hands-on. And um, as we kept in touch over the, the weeks and months, uh, she started to remember more. And so uh, here's another recording I made of her later on the telephone. Thank you, 
would you guys from the movies or you knew it before that? Oh yeah, I heard it before that. And how did it go? Do you remember? that song. Uh, and she gave me other songs too. And uh, what sort of emerged for me was this concept of what I like to call a non-singer. Uh, I think with great exception, and I was over in England this past summer and met a woman who was 102. Uh, so she was still of the greatest generation, uh, which is an exception. I think you're generally left with the pretty aptly named silent generation of the traditionalists. And I find that they fall into two categories. Uh, you have people that uh, like Sheila K. Adams or the late Bobby McMillan or Gene Ritchie sort of took it upon themselves to revive the tradition of their forebears and make a, a show, you know, going on stage and putting bands on their knee and all that. And then you have this other group of people that may remember something their parents shared, but, but either actively rejected it at the time or didn't pay much mind, uh, but, but still had memories of it, just were never, you know, and this is what I call a non-singer, these, these people that never actively did anything with this tradition but still can, can take, you know, they still have some memories of, of these things and can sing these songs. So, so my experience uh, sort of dealing with the recordings uh, that I made of, of Lena's family, it, it tied me over until I got the recordings from the Library of Congress. Uh, and, and I also sort of had this vision in my head of, um, oh, we'll get to her in a minute. This is, this is from a different, uh, I, I had this vision in my head of, of waiting for these recordings and having dealt with the family that they would be, you know, this, it would just be this great revelation. And I was like, you know, come on, Derek, you know, you're probably just hyping yourself up and it's not going to be that great. Well, it was actually that great. <laughs> um, so uh, I'll play you uh, one more couple pieces of, uh, of Lena and her family back from the 30s. Uh, All right. Thank you. Sister saying, I don't think you've ever heard Partridge in a pear tree quite like this. On the first day of Christmas, a celebration tree, Partridge in a pear tree. On the second day of Christmas, a celebration tree, two pear trees and a Partridge in a pear tree. On the third day of Christmas, a celebration tree, three three pear trees. So I was left with this like wealth of unusual, you know, something that really fascinates me is when you can take a song that's been sung a million times and find these really unusual versions. As I've done a lot of my field work, uh, you tend to find the same versions of the same songs by different singers over the, over the country, but uh, the, the Bear family was certainly one of the most unusual. Um, and so uh, I, I began to curate these recordings and, and the old ones and then the new ones I had taken into two albums, and I'll get to that in a minute. But I wanted to return to the idea of a non-singer. Um, you know, certainly uh, the thing that's most valuable in my work, I think, is to find these, these pretty well-documented situations of, of singers from the boom um, just before the war and just after the uh, introduction of of sturdy and available recording technology. So, you know, wax cylinders, most of them pretty much mushed up, but once they kind of got the um, aluminum discs and other sort of disc recorders, it was pretty successful. And there were a lot of recordings made, but I think uh, only a few people rose to the top. And um, you had the Gene Ritchies and the Texas Gladdens and things like this. I don't know if people know who these are, but Pete Seeger had worked with a lot of these singers. Uh, and then there were just a lot of a lot of people lost to obscurity. So uh, in in connecting to some of their descendants, uh, I find that there are a lot of uh, unique and precious memories uh, still available uh, in the minds of these people. And uh, I think that if it's your proclivity to be a singer, uh, you're going to get on stage with a guitar or whatever over and over again. But if it's not your proclivity to be a singer, you're not going to be a singer unless you know you're invited. I think that uh, you know what's what's really uh, become apparent to me is that. Uh, there are there are still thousands of uh, of 
folks of the, of the traditionalists that probably turn these songs over in their head before they go to bed, uh, but, but don't share them with anyone. And, uh, you know, after Nikki had passed away, uh, one of her nieces had said, I just can't believe that because she never sang to the family ever. Um, so, so that's that's a really important uh, piece of my work. And uh, and the, the next slide is uh, there's a woman uh, who was from Middlebury, Vermont, or I think she actually lived in Springfield, Vermont. Helen Hartness Flanders was uh, a senator's wife in Vermont, and uh, she'd gotten invited to uh, produce uh, some writing on some of the poetry and folk music of Vermont. And I think it was just supposed to be a little pamphlet, and it started in 1930 and took her all the way to 1960. Uh, and she ended up getting her hands on some recording equipment. And uh, she produced thousands of recordings. And so here she is with uh, Mrs. Elvin Burdett. And uh, I would describe Elvin as a non-singer. She was just sort of a lay person. Uh, and through the Grange and uh, the grocery store and the newspapers, uh, Helen Flanders reached out to the community and said, uh, she would start producing uh, you know, a Barbara Allen or, or whatever and say, does anyone know a song like this can you write in? And she got thousands of letters and documented thousands of people. Um, so I think it's sort of uh, the popular opinion that you can't do this stuff anymore. And, and I'm kind of here to say, yes, you, you can totally still do this stuff. Um, so uh, I've, I've produced two records so far of the, of the archival and the new. Uh, last Wisps of the Old Ways came out uh, late last year, uh, featured recordings that I just played you of Nikki and, and some of Lena and her family. Uh, in an attempt to give more of a comprehensive overview of, uh, of the family history. And then uh, it was always my feeling that Lena was sort of the, the undiscovered star uh, that had been sort of overlooked by time. And so ever since we've known it, it was sort of an attempt to spotlight uh, some of her talents, because I think that her singing was uh, terrific. So I might play a little bit more of Lena. Okay. Pray for a called Oscar de Breeding, so here he is, and, and I think one of his neighbors performing the same song. So this is a Connecticut version of Paper Things. <laughs> So uh, in my work, it's been it's been interesting being in Connecticut for the last few months because almost everyone who asks us, no, no one in my family ever sang. But if you go pretty much to anywhere else in, in the United States, you can find some evidence of, of singers. Um, but I did have kind of a neat thing happen just last week. Uh, I'd gone to the Library of Congress finally and, and visited the archives and I looked over all the paperwork on Lena and her family uh, in person finally. Found some things that I was missing. Um, but I had also uh, been interested in a different collection of New England uh, folk music by a gentleman called Philip Perry. And, uh, um, and, and while he had recorded most of his collection on cylinder, uh, it, it had held up fairly well and the transfers were pretty listenable. And um, there was a gentleman in there called Adam Morris uh, who performed a version of Lampin, uh, which was the, the uh, song that had caught my attention in the first place. And um, it, it came to be that his uh, granddaughter is still alive and she lives in Bristol. So we went and had Panera Bread last week and she could <laughs> sing me some of the old songs. She said that uh, he used to take her on his knee and think frog went according and she could sing what Bash Cannonball and things like that. So um, so my work is is equal parts uh, finding these these sort of underdocumented singers of yore, uh, 
but also trying to connect to their descendants in hopes that we can sort of bridge the tradition into the modern day. Um, but uh, you know, to me, it's 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 less about what I have to say. I'm always I was interested in what people can share. So I don't know if anyone knows any songs like this that have come tonight, or if anyone has experiences that that they can share. I'd be really interested to, uh, or we could even start taking questions from Zoom. You know, what I'm looking for, and and what's been made all the more monumentally difficult. You know, it's not just boys in black pelt, cheap Stetsons, okay, yeah. but Spotify and YouTube and TikTok and all these things that have sort of corrupted, you know, and and so, you know, five years ago, I might have heard someone sing something like, you know, Scarborough Fair or Barbara Allen at a coffee shop because she learned it on YouTube. And I might have said, ah, it's a really old neat folk song that she knows, you know, but it's not, that's, that's, she's not actually knowing it in as much as she's experienced this organically through growing, growing up and hearing it through oral tradition. You know, what I'm looking for are these, these holdouts that are still, uh, you know, these memories that still exist alongside the TikTok and the YouTube and the iPad and whatever um, from, from pure oral tradition. And, uh, you know, you ask my mother, for instance, what songs she can kind of give me for oral tradition, and it's all Engelbert, Comfort, Dick, and Sinatra. So, you know, in a way that sort of becomes the lexicon of, you know, what your father sang back then, and that's sort of your folklore, I don't want to really call it that, you know, but it's sort of like, that's what my mom can pass down to me, you know, um, so it's, it's interesting what, what sort of becomes, uh, what the word authentic kind of becomes this elephant in the room, you know, because this is what people remember their parents singing, so, so that's what it is, but as far as the stylistic origins of country music, I don't feel qualified to, to dissect that, uh, but it, it, you know, what I'm really looking for is these, these very rare at this point examples of, uh, orally transmitted music that I can still sit in the living room in 2022 or a Panera Bread and hear a hundreds of years old song. Are people making new recordings of this type of music? Yes. Uh, most of my collaborators and contemporaries are in North Carolina and they're still making records and making new records of old ballads. Um, you know, one of the one of the reasons I really liked all the material that I got from the Library of Congress is that it was a little bit raw and there was a lot of speaking and shuffling around and um, kind of detail of the recording room sort of like baked into what was going on musically because I think you can, um, well, for instance, I don't know how many people would know Sheila K. Adams, uh, who's a friend of mine, and uh, here she is doing Barbara Allen. In Scarlet Town, where I was born, there was a fair-made wedding made every youth for our well a day. And they called her Barbara So, I mean, it's like a, a really nice kind of studio situation. There's the three bird that sounds nice and nice. And I think that's great. I think that there are valid recordings that should sound nice and nice, but mine don't have to because we already have that. So. Um, you know, I'm, I'm really interested in, in something that feels a little bit more location specific and can tell more of a, a, a nuanced story than just kind of a bug pinned to a Boy Scout swab of cotton, you know, it's kind of an abstraction. Um, but these, these records are still certainly being made, people are making ballad records all the time. Yeah, so I mean, it's, it's interesting that there's so little folk um, tradition in Connecticut. I actually was getting something tailored last week and I found this little tailor shop in basically Kent and this woman works out of her garage and I was like, you grew up here? And she was like, yeah, this is my parents' house. I was like, and they grew up here? And she was like, yeah. And I was like, anyone ever stay? And she was like, no, <laughs> go figure. But uh, yeah, I mean, North Carolina and Tennessee are certainly hotbeds of this stuff. So that's where I tend to do most of my research, but uh, I'm, I'm open to other situations as well. Um, because Herbert Hubbard had been in the Pine Barrens uh, for one of his first ex ex expeditions uh, I'm, I'm trying to get a piece into the Burlington County newspaper uh, next week to see if anyone remembers the songs because that's, an, again, kind of an isolated and rural area still, uh, what they call the Pineys of New Jersey. So I may have luck, but uh, it's, it's really hard with all the inroads of, of modern civilization to kind of suss out who has an uncorrupted, you know, daisy chain of fathers, 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 saying this 300 years ago. But it's, it's, it's happened a few times. And... Um, one of, one of my favorite stories that I like to tell uh, is that when I went to, uh, I was in Yorkshire for four months uh, this past summer in England, uh, and I went to a little place called Shepley, and everyone says Shipley, and I say Shepley, and they go Shipley. 
I say, no, it's, it's Shetley. No one knows where this is. And I've met a man called uh, Will Noble, who, who also makes these nice modern ballad recordings, reverbed, and, you know, his wife and whatever. And so they sang me some, you know, uh, things like this. singing this version of Frickety Bush, which is a ballad called Hangman, and that's one of the earliest child ballads as well. It's about 500 years old. So, um, you know, you can learn songs all your life and you can, you know, make, make, sing with great aplomb and wow everyone with your harmonies, but I want the things that you have to remember and la 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 la, you know, so I mean, that's really what I'm after is this, this stuff that's kind of from, from pure memory and not just found somewhere. Because Will had cut his teeth in pubs and hunting clubs in England and Forms all the time, but uh, to hear that his uncle used to sing this old old ballad to him when he was a kid, I mean that's 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 the real treat to me. Gary, did you find that there's more tradition there than there is in the U.S. or? No, I think America's really taken the child ballad and the folk song and run with it in some crazy ways. But I think what has happened in England, because there's you know what people always say is 300 years in England is not a long time. But three hours in a car sure is, <laughs> because they're very, very tiny. Uh, you know, to us to go to New Jersey, say, a car for three hours is nothing. But for them, that's a whole day, and they have to rest and all that stuff. So it's it, it's a very, very small country, but it has quite a population. So I think that there's just not a lot of space for you. And so I think the tradition of singing, well, if you were going to sing to your grandkids, you know, you'd probably get who's singing over that, you know, your neighbor would have some objection because most of the houses are, are semi-detached and you can hear the person boiling the kettle next door or whatever. So um, it doesn't really happen anymore. And if it does, it's it's among pretty specialized folk heads who go to pubs all the time or whatever. And so despite Will being one of those, he did have a memory of his uncle singing, but it was, it was terribly hard to find. Um, I don't know if anyone knows that Carol, uh, the Virgin Mary had a baby boy and they said that his name was Jesus. Uh, so I was on the street, uh, going back to the house I was staying at in York, and I saw this gentleman, and I can't tell you why, but he just looked like he was going to know something neat. And I was like, that's weird, it's so impolite, you know, COVID and everything. So I was, you know, I, I turned around at the very end of my street, and I was like, you know, you're here for two more weeks, ask him. And he had, you know, fluffy white hair and this funny looking vest with owls on it or whatever, and I just, he looked like a retired history professor. And I said, you know, I'm, I'm in England, I'm a folklorist, and you, know, you look like someone who might know some songs. And he, we talked about how he knew Barbara Allen a little bit or whatever. And then he said, ah, I'm going to go in my house. 
And he went upstairs and about two minutes later came back and he had this skinny blue book in his hands. And it was uh, Spirituals and Songs of the West Indies by Edgar Connor. And his mother had taken him to the West Indies when he was one and collaborated with Edgar Connor. And that's the reason that that ballad uh, survived and was published because that's the mm -hmm. first place it was published. Wow. So that was pretty cool. So yeah. just had gone on instinct and found out not exactly a folk song per se, but I mean, I don't think anyone would sing that song if it wasn't from his mom. So that was a really neat encounter. Um, you know, someone also suggested to me that I should go to some retirement communities and assisted living because, you know, they were like, you're looking for tradition bears, you know, octogen septuagenarians. That's like shooting fish in a barrel. Can I say that? Yeah, that's some fish. So uh, that didn't really yield a lot in terms of traditional songs, but there were some musical songs that they remembered, these people. Because again, you're left with traditionalists that are in their 70s and 80s, and they're born approximately 1925, 1935, the oldest of them, uh, with the exception of the woman that was born in 1919. Uh, but she sang maybe a music hall song. So uh, not really folk per se, but uh, certainly things before the radio. But it was a much different flavor uh, over in England for some reason. You just don't get as many ancient songs. I would have thought it would be the other way around. You would, you would, yeah. wouldn't you? But it wasn't. Uh, it was. An, it was a puzzling. It was a puzzling trip. Yes. Sorry, I have another question. That's um, fine. Have you found uh, regionally the, that the topics of the songs change? You know, what, are, are they singing about different things in in Tennessee and Connecticut and Vermont? Are, are there uh, because one would ascertain that there is a sociological point to some of the music, right? So, I'm, you know, as a songwriter, I write what I know. Yeah. And that is sometimes the world around me or where I live. So, have you found through your work that, you know, North Carolina they're singing more about cows and Tennessee they're singing mm -hmm. you know, more about Dolly Parton? But, <laughs> you know. Um, Yes and no. Yes, in the sense that I think based on who immigrated to where, you get different uh, different child back. So just to backpedal, because I think I've used that phrase several times and I haven't explained it. Uh, there was a gentleman in the 19th century named Francis Child who categorized 300 popular ballads into a list. So uh, folk music nerds are like, oh, that's child number whatever. And that's kind of a, a, a lexicon of, uh, of 300 pretty popular ballads, but not every old good song is a child ballad, and not every child ballad is a good song, so uh, it's sort of problematic. But uh, when you're looking for the old songs, you can often find Barbara Allen, for instance, is a child ballad, it's number 84. Um, but to answer your question, you find that some of these ballads, and I think it's, it's, it's hard to say that it's only location-based, but some of these ballads seem to have traveled with a certain sect of Irish and then another, you know, would go up to North Carolina, a different Irish family, and they would have different repertoire. But I also have found, uh, so Lampkin was pretty cruel, right? I mean, it's a pretty gratuitously cruel song. And you, for some reason, find that families that tend to sing that song will also sing things like the Greenwood Society, which talks about, you know, also stabbing. This mother has two babes and kills them, and then has this vision of them playing and says, oh, if you were mine, I would dress you in silk so fine. And they say, well, we were yours and killed us. So what are you talking about? It's a really curious song. But I find that a lot of times families that sing sort of the, the more uh, gratuitously violent songs, they often sing all of them. You know, like Edward puts that blood on your shirt sleeve. That seems to go along with that. But it's not always the case. And, and I think it was really down to, um, well, there are a lot of reasons. I think that there were certain songs that uh, singers just wouldn't give to people like Alan Lomax because it was uncouth, or something like Lampkin would come out with great reluctance because it's so unusual. People would want to sing the popular songs, which Lomax took. Albert didn't really. Uh, they would want to sing the more sentimental songs. They would want to sing the songs with the more interesting melodies. Um, so it's you can sort of pick out a data set, and you can kind of see the trends. But, but again, it's, it's also down to just the choices people make. And, you know, having studied this stuff and, and I sing as well, you know, if someone came up to me and just put me on the spot, I think I'd probably call it like two or three songs out of the dozens I know. You know, your mind just goes blank. I think sometimes after the fact, you're like, ah, oh, there's that one too. You know, and it's just, that's the way of being human works, you know? And, and so sometimes doing this field work, you have to correspond 
for, for several lengths of time with, with some of your informants for months and months to get to get a real sense of someone's repertoire. And you don't always have that luxury of time. Sometimes you just have to move on. So it's it's um, it's definitely loaded with pitfalls and error and forgetfulness and regionality and uh, discretion and impression management. And so, um, but some of the same songs come up over and over again, Red River Valley or Cindy or, uh, that wasn't a very helpful answer, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, but, I mean, you can look at you know, how many times was the whole circle be unbroken? How mm -hmm. many times has that been reported? That, that probably dates back to the 1920s and, and the Carter family. Again, and not, I'm not trying to take this in a, on a country music track, but that's an example of a song that's traveled through the generations. You look at, um, you, know, you look at, at Gypsy Jazz, that's still, we're still playing that. Mm -hmm. But I think that's one of the beautiful things about music. Um, but I, yeah, I, yeah, it, you answered the question as best as you could. It, it, it just, it's a curiosity of, of, well, you know, Tennessee, there's a different life going on. North Carolina, different life. Connecticut, different life. So, but people travel and songs travel. So. Mm -hmm. Well, I do want to point out that although the songs are what I look for initially, I find that they're sort of the banner headline and the people's lives sort of become the articles, you know, and you'd rather read the article than the headline over again. Yeah. So uh, getting to know Nikki and, and, and memories of Lena, uh, that was almost more substantial and more enjoyable than, than the music, which the music is so good. Her voice is so good. But, uh, you know, uh, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm still getting stories, you know, just a couple of weeks ago, one of her grandchildren called me and said, They'd been talking to another one of the grandchildren, and when they were young, uh, a coal stove had some of the coals had fallen out and fell on my sister's leg, and they knew to send for Lena, and she could draw fire, which means that by praying and, and waving your hand over the burn, there's some sort of faith, faith healing going on, and and the burn disappears. And I've done some research on this, and it seems to be a thing people in Tennessee and North Carolina believe in that you can, you know, you read stories on YouTube. Oh yeah, I spilled coffee all down my face when I was five and I was going to be scalded, but you know, my mom prayed over it and breathed on it. And two saints came in from the North, one barren frost, one barren fire and frost out fire or something. And boom, you're, you're healed. So, you know, I take it with a, a pinch of salt or a handful of salt, but uh, you know, you still get these interesting riveting stories about the mythical sort of, nature of mountain tradition. And to me, that that framework is almost more interesting than the music. You know, her husband had a World War One pension. And so for the disadvantaged people in the community, uh, they, they would get them flour and sugar and eggs and things with this war pension for, to, to feed the less privileged families in the region. And it's, it's things like that, I think, that are more substantial almost than the music kind of leads you into this person's life. And then you're more in awe of the life than the songs. Did we have any questions online? No, no, not at this time. So if you do have a question, you can hear her on Zoom. Yeah. Uh, Derek, you've collected so much, not only music, but information about the people and everything. And all this history, you're recording this for us? For whom? Who's for us. us. For the, the general us. And how does this get disseminated? Um, I've written a few articles okay. and I'm continuing to write them. I'm doing something uh, for a folklore journal right now. And uh, Lena was on the cover of the Old Time Herald, which is a, the, the photo I showed at first is because uh, so she, she was their cover girl. I mean, how couldn't she be? And, uh, you know, and again, I mean, it makes me think of how Helen Flanders would put advertisements in the newspaper and go to the Granges and say, who remembers this stuff and what can you share? It's so much less about what I have to say. And it's so much more about what, what people can bring and what memories they have. To me, that's that's the ultimate goal is to uh, hold on to some of this stuff. Um, you know, towards the end of her life, she lived to be 99. You know, I made some phone recordings of my grandma and just pulled my phone out while she was on the phone. You go listen to those and you forget that she used to say things like you, you lose so much stuff yeah. just going through your life. And I think to hold on to it at least somehow. To access it if you want you know you can't drag your whole life around with you you pop, pop over but to, to be able to have that and celebrate that from time to time i think is a treat yeah 
We do have a question here. Why did you choose North Carolina and not some other place? North Carolina chose me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've done work and I've, I've corresponded a lot with Muntla, which is the Memorial University in Newfoundland Folk and Language Archives. Uh, and they're, they're like a, another destination for me uh, is Newfoundland because uh, what I didn't realize until recently, you sort of expected to say in Newfoundland. If you go to someone's house, um, for, for a cocktail party or something, you're expected to bring a ballad, and if you don't, it's impolite. So people know a lot of songs up there. Um, and, and I did spend time in England, like I said. Uh, Lena, I just felt, was she's just so good, and she such a fine voice that I think she really needed her due, uh, and, and to try and give her some of that was, uh, was sort of, that was like the initial impulse for this project, and it sort of came out sideways, and now it's like a memory project or like a story core project. But, yeah, I don't know. North Carolina chose me, definitely. <laughs> Languages die every day, and so do songs. Uh, I was talking to a woman in Pennsylvania, and, and her family saying in an Italian dialect that doesn't exist anymore. I mean, there were a lot of Italian dialects. Italy has its own little, you know, every neighborhood has its own, whatever. But uh, anyway, it, you know. And she doesn't have recordings of those either, and it's gone now. That language is gone. So, um, you know, it's, well, I don't I, think Russian's going anywhere anytime. No, probably. Well, no, especially not now. But anyway, that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, any other? Uh, yeah, but I think we've done it. I, sorry, I have one more question. Absolutely. Have, have you been able to trace any of the original songwriters back? Any has anyone um, been able to find out, perhaps, who wrote? The, the song in 1890 or who um that's not really my my expertise although sometimes like with this virgin mary thing you get sort of the, the origin of why it's even accessible in the first place which was pretty cool but um i did put in a, a, an article in the avery uh uh herald avery county times the newspaper in avery county where lena was born i can't think of the name of the newspaper um uh, anyway uh, a, a blind man called me a week later and said that he uh, was descended from Lulu Bell and Scotty and proceeded to sing When the Sun Goes Down Again over the phone for me. Um, so uh, not the writers per se, but you know, you get these stories of kind of where these songs came from and why people happen to know them. But I'm not, um, unless, it was, unless it was a really undocumented old song and, and I was desperate to figure out you know, where it came from, most of the songs I work with you can kind of tell where the origins were in the first place, and then you know, thanks to the wonder of the internet, even if you don't know where it came from after a little digging, you can find at least one version of it. Sometimes you can't, which is always fun. Did you, um, have you found that the people who had sung for you, um, some old songs, did you ever encounter them inventing their own? I haven't yet, but I look forward to it. Uh, I was in England and I was being sort of discouraged by a colleague who's done a lot of field recordings. I think he's got 912 in the British Library from the 50s, 60s, and 70s. He's quite a bit older than I am. And he was like, you're just not going to, it just doesn't happen anymore. And, and I found a few, obviously, they proved him wrong. But he said, uh, and sometimes they just don't cooperate. I guess he, there was a version of Lord Bateman, some woman sang him, and she was like, how does it go? Lord Bateman was, Lord Bateman was a dirty fool. You know, that was all he got out of her. And so she clearly did not know that song. You know, it was an invention. Or um, Alan Lomax had filmed Ray Hicks uh, and one of his relatives, and they did this Indian bear dance that people still do, but it was actually Ray and his cousin making it up as they went along. And by the end of the video, they're rolling around laughing because they're being so silly. So you get misled, but. Um, Fortunately, that hasn't happened to me yet, or maybe unfortunately. I haven't had any inventions yet. You can, you can pretty much check what people are giving you against what's on the internet and say, yeah, this is an older song. But I, I would love some local nonsense. Bring it on. You know. <laughs>